Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a video called What is a Protocol? In this video, we're going to learn exactly what a protocol is and how it's used by computers to allow them to communicate on a network. Then we're going to take a look at something called the OSI model to help further our understanding of protocols. Now, if you've ever tried learning about the OSI model before, or maybe you had heard from somebody about the OSI model and how difficult it was to understand, don't worry. I'm going to give you a very simple way to understand what it is and how it works. So let's go back to the original question. What is a protocol? If you look up the word protocol in the dictionary, you, you'll find many different definitions. Uh, but the one I like to use is, is a pretty simple one. It just says that a protocol is a set of rules and procedures used for communication. So what this means is that a protocol is what's going to set the rules and procedures that computers must use if they want to communicate with each other on a network. All right, now this definition still may not make complete sense or you may not fully understand what I mean. So I want to use an example to try to explain it better. So let's say that you have a letter that you'd like to send to a friend. And you've decided that you'd like to send this letter via the United States Postal Service. Well, they have a set of rules and procedures for mailing that letter. And we're going to call that the United States Postal Service Protocol. Now, the first rule is that the letter must be in some form of packaging or in an envelope. So here we have an envelope to put our letter in. Once the letter has been placed in the envelope, the next thing we have to do is put a destination address on the envelope. So here we have our destination address. After we write in the destination address, we need to give it a source address or what's sometimes referred to as a return address. So here in the upper left hand corner of our envelope, we're going to put our return address. After we address the envelope with our source and destination addresses, we have to pay the United States Postal Service to mail this for us or put it out on their network. And the way you pay them is by affixing a stamp of a certain value based upon the weight of the package. So here in the upper right hand corner, I have attached a stamp. Now before we go any further, I want to point out one little side note. And that is that each one of these items, putting the letter in the envelope or the type of envelope, the location and the formatting of each of our addresses, the location of the stamp, etc., etc., each of these individually kind of have their own set of rules. So really, it's not the United States Postal Service protocol, but it's the USPS protocol stack. Because it's a stack of little mini protocols all working together to make up the United States Postal Service protocol. Now, we'll come back and revisit that concept of a stack of protocols a little bit later on. Let's go ahead and move on from here. Once we have addressed our envelope, we put a stamp on it, the letters in it, we sealed it. Well, we have to have a way of getting it out onto the United States Postal Service network. So we go ahead and put it in the mailbox. And if we follow all those rules and procedures as they have been established by the United States Postal Service, well, then our letter will get to our friend. Now let's change our example just a little bit. Let's say instead of sending the letter using the United States Postal Service, we want to send it using FedEx. Well, FedEx has their own rules and procedures, and we'll call that the FedEx protocol. Now with the FedEx protocol, you have to take the letter and put it in a special FedEx envelope. Once you have the letter in the envelope, you have to then attach one of these FedEx air bills. Once you attach the air bill, you have to then address the envelope by filling out the source and destination addresses. Once you have addressed the envelope, you have to make a payment to use the FedEx service. And you'll see here there's a number of payment options, including using an account number or a credit card or a few other options they have listed there. Once we've made payment, you then have to find a way to get it out onto the FedEx network by either putting the letter in a FedEx mailbox taking it down to the FedEx station, calling for a pickup. But if you follow the rules and procedures as they've been established by FedEx, then your letter gets to your friend. Now, there's a number of these protocols out there. I'm sure there's a number of other companies that you're thinking of right now that you could use to send that letter. Well, it works the same way with computers. There are a number of different protocols on a computer network. But one thing you have to keep in mind, Computers on a network must agree upon a common protocol in order to communicate. 
The example I have here is we're trying to send this letter using FedEx, but the destination address is a U US PO box. Well, that by default is not allowed. And the reason why is because you're trying to send using the FedEx protocol and receive using the United States Postal Service protocol. One piece of information I didn't mention on the FedEx side, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is when you send a FedEx letter, it has to be signed for. Well, if you send to a PO box, there's no one there to sign for. It's just a box. So there is a way of doing it, but only if you were to send the letter to a location that had a physical street address and a human there to sign for it. And in computer terms, we refer to that person, that person that's signing for it, as a gateway. Now, that's a term we'll get into in just a little bit, but a gateway is a protocol translator. This is the person who will basically complete the FedEx process and then go ahead and move it over to the United States Postal Service process and put it in your P.O. box for you. Now, one thing I'd like you to notice is that each individual carrier has their own set of rules and procedures to get a letter from you to your friend. But there are certain communication standards that all carriers must follow. So in this example, it didn't matter whose protocol we were using, that protocol required that there be some form of packaging for your letter. And then there had to be some form of addressing of that package. And then there had to be some form of payment to the carrier. And then there had to be some way of getting the package out onto that carrier's network. So it doesn't matter whether you use the United States Postal Service or whether you use FedEx or any other carrier. You must have certain standards in place in order to have that communication work. Well, this is done on the computer networking side through something called the OSI model. So what is this OSI model? Well, in the 1970s, the International Standards Organization, or ISO, developed the Open Systems Interconnection Reference Model, which is quite a mouthful, that's why we just simply call it the OSI model, to define the basic standards for network communication. That's what the OSI model is. Now the OSI model is made up of seven layers, and I have them listed for you here. We have our application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical layers. And one of the very first things that you really need to get a grasp of in order for you to understand how the OSI model works is to just know these seven layers, know the names, know the order. Now the way most people learn this is by taking the first letter of each of those layers and then coming up with some kind of fun little mnemonic saying that would help them remember these letters. And one of the most common ones you'll find out there is all people seem to need data processing. Now if you can remember that saying, all people seem to need data processing, you can remember the first letter and then with just a very little amount of studying, you could then remember the seven actual layers, the, the seven actual names. Now if all people seem to need data processing doesn't sound like something that you would hang on to, well, another real common one out there just to get away from technology would be from the bottom up please do not throw sausage pizza away I don't know if that works any better for you but that's that's another one I've heard used heavily out there now if you didn't like either of those two examples just for the fun of it I have pulled a few more off the internet for you there's quite a few of them out there and it really doesn't matter what you use as long as you come up with something that helps you to remember what the names of the seven layers of the OSI model are. I mentioned earlier that some people find the OSI model to be a very difficult topic for them to understand. So what I've done is put together a reference sheet here which will hopefully help you to understand how the OSI model functions. Now this is a very busy looking piece of information so what I want to do is go over each piece one section at a time and then when we're all done you should have an overall understanding of what you're looking at. Now the first piece that I want to show you is this section right over here where I've given a one or two word definition or reference to what takes place or what functionality takes place within each of the seven layers of the OSI model. 
So let me go over the, each one of these one at a time. Right up here at the top, let's start with the application layer. The application layer deals with network APIs. Now, if you've never heard of an API before, it stands for Application Programming Interface. So a network API is just that. It's an interface from the application to the network. It's, it's a way of the application being able to say, hey, network, I've got something I need to put out there, something I need to send. Moving down from there, the presentation layer deals with the formatting of the data itself. What format are we going to put the data in to go out onto the network? Moving down a layer from there, down to the session layer, put synchronization. It's at this layer that the two computers, you'll notice on the screen that we do have two different computers and two different OSI models going on here. Uh, we'll come back to how they actually talk to one another, but it's at this session layer that we have synchronization taking place between these two computers during the communication process. Going down a layer, the transport layer, I just have one word written there, packets. And sometimes I write that as two words, packet management. Now, first of all, what is a packet? Well, when you want to put data out on a network, so let's say you are sending an email across the network. Well, that email of information is not sent as one solid piece of information. It has to be broken into a lot of different pieces to be able to travel on the copper wire or through the airways of our networks. And each of those little pieces are called packets. And it's at the transport layer that we deal with this packet management, it's where we break this into pieces, put the pieces in order, and make sure that all the pieces get from point A to point B. Moving down then to the network layer, well, this is where we have addressing or routing. Now, just like when we sent a letter through the, whether it be the post office or whether it be through FedEx, we had to address that package, right? Well, that takes place here at the network layer in computer communication. Moving down a layer from there, the data link layer deals with data frames. Now a data frame, the best example I could give you of a data frame, it, it's like the envelope that you put the letter into. Okay, it's, it's a way of taking the packet and putting it into a packaging, put it into a format of packaging. And I don't want to confuse you with the word formatting up here, but it's the format not of the data, but of the package itself, the envelope itself to be ready to go out onto the specific network. And then finally we wrap it up down here with the physical layer, which I just wrote hardware. The physical layer has to do with, hey, how are we connected to the network? So that is what takes place at each of the seven layers of the OSI model. Now that you know what functionality takes place at each of those layers, we need to learn a little bit about how data travels through the OSI model. Now in this illustration you'll notice that I have two computers and it's significant that they have been drawn above the OSI model, at the top of the OSI model. Because down here at the bottom you'll see that I have our network cable. Now this network cable could be a physical cable or it could represent a wireless network but either way it's significant that the computers are at the top and the connection is at the bottom. And the reason why is because in order for data to get from a sending computer to a receiving computer, it must first go down through the OSI model to get to that network connection in order to go across the network and then go up through the OSI model to get back to the receiving computer. And that is significant to understand. The sending computer always sends data down through the OSI model and the, on the receiving side, it's always going up through the OSI model. Now to give you a little more detail on this, what happens is you start off with raw data coming from the sending computer who sends it down to the application layer. The application layer then attaches its piece of information to the data. The application layer then sends it down to the presentation layer who attaches its piece of information who sends it down to the session layer, who attaches its information, etc., etc., etc. Now, I want to stop here at the data link layer for just a moment because each of these pieces of information that I'm talking about is very often referred to as a header to the data. It's adding header information to the data. 
Now the data link layer does something special. The data link layer adds not only a piece of header information, but also adds a trailer to the data. And it's that trailer that is used for error checking to make sure that the data was not corrupted in transmission. So each layer adds a piece of header information. The data link layer adds a header and trailer, passes it down to the physical layer who adds its information to the header, sends it out across the network, and then when it hits the physical layer, this physical layer strips off the information that this physical layer on the sending side had added. Then it sends it up to the data link layer who will then strip off the header and trailer that the corresponding data link layer had added on the other side. And then it passes up to the network layer who strips off what the network layer added, etc., 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 all the way until when you get up to the receiving computer, you end up with raw data that the sending computer originally wanted it to see. Now even though the data travels down from layer to layer and up from layer to layer, the reality is, let me clear this out of here, each individual layer believes that it is communicating with its corresponding layer straight across on the other side. And that is what these dotted lines represent. They represent the virtual communication that is taking place between the similar layers on the sending computer and the receiving computer. See, because as the data travels down through the OSI model and each layer adds its piece of information, well, the corresponding layer on the other side is the one who is going to acknowledge and then strip off that information. So let me go ahead and see if I can't illustrate this for you. The whole communication process works like this. On the sending computer, we have some data. And I need to get that data over to another computer. So what the sending computer is going to do is it's going to pass that data down through the OSI model where each layer will add its own piece of information to this data to assist in the process of communication. Once it gets to the bottom of the OSI model, it is then sent across the network cable over to the other computer. Then it's at the bottom of the OSI model on that computer where each layer is going to acknowledge and strip off that individual piece of information that the corresponding layer had added on the sending side until we end up with just some raw data for the receiving computer. So if we come back here to our reference guide, you'll see that there is one part that we haven't covered yet, and that's over here on the left, where I've written in the names of certain network devices, and I've put them with their corresponding OSI model layer in which they have functionality. Now we're not going to go into the details of these devices in this particular video. This is something we'll cover later on but I wanted you to have a reference point with regards to the OSI model. So that is your one page reference guide to everything you should need to know about the OSI model. After watching this video, you should now be able to explain what a protocol is and how we use it to communicate on a network. And just to keep it simple, remember a protocol is really just a set of rules and procedures for communication. You should also now be able to define the seven layers of the OSI model and explain its significance within a network and how that relates to protocol communication. Remember that the OSI model sets the standard rules for all network communication.